Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, a trip to two dairy farms near Jefferson City, Missouri, in the heartland of the USA. And while we're touring dairy farms, it is in order, of course, that our special studio guest on this week's show is Ed Groff, who heads up the Dairy Commodity Department at the National Farmers Organization. Ed, it's a pleasure to have you back with us again. Glad to be here, Bill. You know, I think you will see as we watch the interview with uh, the Wansing brothers at Mita, Missouri, that uh, they have this attitude toward dairy prices right now, Ed, as NFO members. Prices are better, but they aren't good enough. I think that indicates that progress has been made by NFO and more progress is in the offing. I'd like for you to just tell us what kind of accomplishments you have made in price, say, through the past year. I think uh, if we take a look at this chart, I can show you since the holding action and up till just last year, really what's happened. Now, this is drawn out, and you see here from 1967, through 1969. Notice what happened here from 1967 to 1968 in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Now this is important. Wisconsin and Minnesota series price. It's important because this price affects the price in all the federal orders throughout the entire United States. I see. So I wanted to go back to 67 and show what happened in 68. Notice the little fluctuation in the price of the Wisconsin-Minnesota series price. Mm -hmm. Really not a great deal of increase. That's right. Here is the supply of milk from January through the full year of 1967. When we come to 1968 in April, the government increased the support price on the manufactured product, so this in turn affects the price of milk in all the federal orders, and it did. See what happened? It went up, but still, outside of this one little spurt, as I'll say, it came back down again. 1969, it went above the support price because you notice that held constant, clear over until March of 1970, based on 3.5 butterfat milk. But look what happened last year in 1969. Now this arrow points to February, February 9th to be exact. And you notice at this point what was happening to the Wisconsin-Minnesota series price. It was increasing higher than they had ever seen it before. It continued to increase right up till it got to $4.67 a hundred. Notice how much higher that is than any place in here with a support price the same. Now let's look at the supply. The peak was higher in 67 than in 68, and higher in 68 than in 69. But the important thing is that for the last five months of 69, the supply in here was greater than it was for those same months on these years, and the price continued to go right up. Now remember this helped increase the price in all the federal marketing orders because they base their price on the Wisconsin-Minnesota series price. Mm -hmm. Now, that in itself, Bill, gave an increase to all the farmers in all the federal order areas. But that's not the, the total answer. We did that through supply contracts simply by creating competition in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So I would say in the last year, that's the biggest effect we've had. And there's, there's what it, how it happened, why it happened. Supply contracts. Ed, the dairy farmers we talked to down in the Jefferson City area were very pleased with the fact that a new transfer station had been just recently completed there. Now, do you have transfer stations all over the country? Bill, we will have if we don't have them now. We've got them in several areas, and I would think, too, that they'd be very pleased in it because, again, I'd like to explain how this will affect the price of milk. Now, the supply contracts in Wisconsin and Minnesota affect the price all over the nation, and with transfer stations all over the nation, we will be able to affect the price to the handlers and to the producer by taking a supply of milk from that given area 
and not necessarily marketing it to a handler in the area, but doing just the opposite. Move it to a handler way out of the area. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill, there's something I'd like to explain very thoroughly on this. It's been a known fact that the processing industry today, or the people that market the milk through the cooperatives, have taken the producer's milk from the low-priced areas and have marketed into high-priced areas. Mm -hmm. But remember, they never were organized like NFO, where they could move the milk from a low-priced area to a high-priced area, and at the same time, move milk from the high-priced area to another area so that there, there was a vacuum there so they didn't kill the price. What's been happening before, and I'll give you an example. Milk could be moved from Wisconsin to a southern state, and let's say the price in Wisconsin would be $4.50 a hundred. The milk in possibly a southern state would bring $6 a hundred. This milk could be marketed, and probably was, for $5.50 in the southern state. Now, do you see what that does? Yes. It immediately kills the price in the We're high price in the high priced area yes. it will help in the low priced area but this is something you can't uh, continue to do because at that point you're pitting farmer against farmer this is again. very true so with the national organization and the transfer stations we have been able to move milk now let me give you an or tell you where this is happening and what is happening the transfer station that you saw that milk was moving on to the Oklahoma and Texas market and at a price that it would not kill the price for the Texas and Oklahoma producers. At the same time, it would increase the price to the Missouri producers. Now, Bill, it isn't only because we negotiated for a higher price either. We were doing it more efficiently. The same thing that has been happening with cattle and hogs and grain. We are eliminating some of the unnecessary costs that go with marketing. And all farmers have to do is put that production together and they can find out they can do it and get more net dollars back to the producer. Ed, I know that we are already seeing big over-the-road dairy tank trucks right. carrying milk products to higher-priced areas to carry out this marketing strategy. Will we be seeing more of uh, this type of vehicle? Yes, you'll be seeing more of these vehicles all over the United States. These are carrying NFO milk, nothing but NFO milk. They're going to the higher priced areas and again, creating the vacuum in the areas that we can fulfill or fill from another area and always keeping an upward pressure on the price that the producer will receive. In just a moment, we're going to be visiting those two dairy farms in Missouri. We're going to see to some degree some of the investment that a dairy farmer must have today to be a grade-A dairyman and to ply his trade. Now, milk prices today, and I think I'm right about this, are about what they were to the farmer, to the dairy farmer, 20 years ago. Is that not correct? That's correct. Now, look what has happened, Ed, in that dairyman's production costs through the past 20 years. For example, some of the equipment that we'll be seeing in this right. film it's probably, what, doubled? I would say that at least doubled. I think more than that, Bill. I think more than doubled. Yeah. Some, of the, uh, some of the costs uh, have more than doubled, as you say, and yet the dairyman today, the farmer is getting exactly what he got 20 years ago. What's happened to that milk at the retail level, by the way? Well, I think to put this in the correct perspective, the producer is getting about what he got in 1948. That's 22 years ago at least. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting more than we got five, six, eight years ago, so we've helped. We have a long way to go. The producers' production costs have more than doubled, Bill. The price to the consumer has approximately doubled. So you can certainly see that the unorganized farmer has been left out. Now we're making these strides and these gains. And when you mention the tank trucks going all over the country, I'm sure that farmers can realize the effect that this has when they realize this is all NFO milk. And now the major handlers in Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, 
Michigan, and Wisconsin are accepting this supply and looking for more from NFO. You can see the stride we've made. I think perhaps this next question you've already answered, but this kind of thing can be repeated, I think, with uh, some degree of efficiency. What can the dairyman across the country do to better his plight, to get his price? No secret at all. <laughs> Organize, join the NFO, put this block of milk together so the handlers, the buyers have to come to the organized farmer. And it takes a nationwide organized group. That's why NFO is the successful organization. That's why the progressive farmers are joining NFO. It's that simple. Ed, I want you to enjoy with me and with our audience two or, th well, three actually, progressive NFO farmers, dairymen in uh, Missouri near Jefferson City. At this time, we will be visiting the dairy farms of John and Lawrence Wanzing and Victor Bremer. Now, we're standing, uh, John and Lawrence, in uh, your milking parlor, which is referred to as a pit-type parlor. Obviously, it's called a pit-type parlor because we're sort of in a pit. We're at a low level as compared with uh, the cows. What's the advantage, uh, John, in your opinion, of the pit type of parlor? Well, uh, the main advantage is you don't have to stoop to see what you're doing. You can wash the cows and uh, dry them and put your milking machine on, and uh, you can stand up there and see what you're doing rather than crawl around your knees and turn upside down, yeah, you might well, say. You're just closer to your work, aren't That's you, right. really? That's right. I imagine that... Uh, after you uh, would milk 70 cows or 75, as you fellas do, and if you were on the same level with them, stooping as you would have to do, the old back would tell you something before the day was over, huh? Uh, I agree <laughs> with you there. Yes, yeah. sir. You know, back caused trouble anyhow once. Truly, truly. <laughs> truly. Lawrence, uh, the stalls here in your milking parlor are most interesting. Now, these are designed and manufactured uh, by uh, Surge, are they not? That's right. And what do they call these? They call these the, the sawtooth stalls. They're actually a herringbone, but a sawtooth design. It's a modified herringbone. And uh, by having the sawtooth type indentations along the edge here, it allows you fellas to really get in right next to the cow and then do your work. It That's right. gets you closer to your business. You don't have to reach as far. That's right. Well, now you fellas uh, are milking 75 cows. Uh, what kind of production do you get in a day out of these uh, 75 ones? Approximately 350 gallon a day. 350 gallons of milk a day. Yes. Now, in terms of pounds, uh, we multiply that by 8.6, and we're not going to get into mathematics, but you get a few pounds of milk here a day. Well, that's right. And uh, with the present situation in this part of Missouri, with the recently opened uh, milk collection point, would you uh, mention to our viewers exactly what happens to your milk production here? and the other uh, NFO uh, dairy producers' milk production? Yes, it's, it's picked up by a truck here at the farm every other day, and it's transported to a collection point where it's then pumped over into a tanker and transported directly into Oklahoma. Now, at the present time, you're shipping all of your production. In fact, all of the NFO production in this area is going to Oklahoma, right? That's right. Now, there has to be reason for that, John, and... Uh, I guess the reason, obviously, is as a part of NFO's marketing uh, concept, by shipping there, you fellas are getting more money for your product, aren't you? That's right. And uh, hopefully, uh, it will eventually, perhaps, raise the price in this area, which happens to be a little depressed at this time. How much more money are you getting? It amounts to about 11 cents a 100 pounds. Now, this is a, what, a net increase after you've paid everything yeah, else, uh, that, like that's transportation and, that's net, yes. and so forth. Yes. Well, that's great. Now, let's talk a minute here about the care that is given your product at the grade A level, at which level you and Lawrence operate. Uh, the milk is never touched by human hands. No, that's right. It goes direct from the cow to a pipeline to the tank, and, and uh, of course, the tank truck then pumps it direct out of the tank, and uh, it's not handled in any way whatsoever. 
outside of with equipment. Right. Now, you are required to chill this milk down to what degree Fahrenheit? Uh, 40 degrees. Uh, 40 or under. What, uh, what is your average uh, temperature here uh, for uh, your milk? About 34. 34 degrees. Right. Well, you're a little close to freezing. That's yeah, cold uh, milk. A little bit colder than uh, yeah. it should be, I guess. Well, uh, now, what about the, the tank truck? that picks up your milk. Uh, you transfer it from your 34-degree uh, tank into an insulated truck. Uh, what sort of a temperature rise occurs in, say, a period of 24 hours? Well, they tell me only about two degrees. And that, if, even if the sun is shining brightly. Even in the hottest day. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, actually, the, the plan here uh, certainly in no way uh, impairs the the freshness of this milk. It no, stays no. refrigerated, That's actually. Right, yes. How many acres of land uh, are you fellows farming, Lawrence? Well, we have a total of 700. It's not all in cultivation, however, but uh, we have 700. Uh, do you have a part of it in pasture land? Yes, a good deal of it in pasture land. Uh, what is your biggest crop you're raising on your acreage? Uh, corn and hay, mostly. Are you able to raise here uh, all of the crops you need to feed your herd, or do you have to buy some feed? We have to buy some corn, but uh, all the hay and the silage is raised uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. And uh, what about your uh, replacement calves? Uh, are you they're, raising your own? Yes, but they're all raised here yeah. on the farm. How long have you fellas uh, been in the dairy business here? All our lives, actually. Have you? <laughs> what about uh, your father before you all? Was he a farmer? Yes, uh, that's where we all started from. Uh, he was in the milking business when we came along, and in a small way, of course, mm -hmm. and, and just progressed from there. In 62, when John and I took the farm over, and he I retired. See. Well, now, is this the old uh, home farm that, this that is you're the, on? This is the home place, I yes. I see. And are both of you married and raising your families here? No, I'm married and have my family. John isn't married. John's an old bachelor, huh? Oh, I guess that's what well, you call it. Well, you know, it might work <laughs> out for him one of these days. <laughs> well, now, I want to ask you uh, a couple of other things about uh, your place here and uh, the job that you fellows are doing. Uh, first of all, what, what attracted you at the beginning to NFO, John? Well, you know, way back there uh, when they first started in them dollar days, you know, uh, everybody jumped on the bandwagon, and uh, we got on the bandwagon back then and just stayed right on it, see? And and uh, I, I think it's one of the things that you're going to have to uh, go over to, mm -hmm. to make these farm prices come up where they ought to be. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been a member? Well, uh, if you were a dollar member, you'd date back a few years. Yeah, that's uh, how long has that been ago? <laughs> I don't 15 know, but it's been years, a long I guess, time. Almost. A long time. I presume that uh, you took part in the great milk holding action of not so long yeah, ago. I'll sure say we did. Yes, <laughs> indeed. What do you recall you were you getting for your milk at that time? It was a ridiculously low uh, price. About four dollars and thirty cents, or something in that order. Uh, and as I recall, it was uh, almost impossible before that action to uh, get a voice uh, with the uh, people in Washington, and uh, the action uh, accomplished what it was meant to accomplish. Uh, I sure believe it did, and uh, and lots of other people will say that too. That. Uh, well, some that uh, really didn't believe it before, you know, but they, they, they can see the light now. Uh, are you, uh, are you, are you making it based on today's prices? Well, we have to do the best we can, but uh, we hope those prices come up uh, a little more. It wouldn't hurt. Do you feel like you're marginal now? Are you, are you making a, a living at it? I'm making a living, yes. But you want a better living out and of just it. Just as well. And a better uh, price for your product. The, the man in the factory there, he can strike for higher wages, and nobody seems to complain about it. But seems to be a part of the American way. That's right. But when farmers, uh, they, a lot of people are... Uh, got a little touchy about this milk holding action, yes, you know. Yes. You told us giving the law, sin, and all that stuff, uh, dumb milk. But you know, when the guy in the city doesn't work, uh, they don't care about that. You know, um, the uh, milk holding action, I think, perhaps was the one single 
uh, dramatic activity on the part of NFO that attracted perhaps more farmers to the organization than anything else they've ever done. And uh, since that time, of course, the NFO has, uh, has certainly come up in the world in terms of membership, in terms of general attitude on the part of, of farmers and uh, urban dwellers all across the country. It's a far different NFO today than it was back in what you refer to as the dollar days. Oh, well, that's right. There have been lots of changes made. John, in your opinion, what's it going to take for the dairy farmer to get a fair price for his product at the marketplace? Well, I think uh, this NFO program is the thing that's going to do it, uh, if, if anything will. How many uh, dairy farmers uh, do you have in this immediate area near Mita? Oh, we, we have about six, seven. Mm -hmm. Are most of them uh, members of NFO? Um, most of them, yes. How many uh, dairy farmers in this area generally uh, are, uh, are having their milk picked up by NFO and uh, having it taken to the collection point? Well, I think all of them that are NFO members. Are all NFO members, members are participating. Yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. That's the answer to it. You know, uh, speaking of the marketplace, it seems to me, Lawrence, when you go to the marketplace to buy some of the equipment that you need in order to operate your business, uh, you pay the price that the manufacturer asks. That's right. As instead, you of, uh, instead of uh, going and saying, well, I'll give you uh, X number of dollars for that tractor, he won't let you have it for that. <laughs> sure won't. And speaking of that and tractors, I noticed uh, today around your place that you fellas have a terrific investment in rolling equipment. You have five or six tractors, a lot of heavy equipment out there. What do you suppose it would cost you to replace that equipment today on today's market? Uh, today's price is probably $80,000 or more. Uh -huh. Now, let's have a little just informal uh, appraisal time here of what you might have in your operation here in the way of an investment. Now, we'll take that 80,000. You have a, a herd of 75 purebred Holsteins, and uh, these cows uh, are worth what kind of money today? You have to pay anywhere from 400 to $1,000 for a good Holstein cow, don't you? That's right. So uh, what are they worth, $40,000, $50,000? Well, probably not in the Sandy, yes. And you have a calf herd coming up. Uh, how many calves are you feeding right well, now? Well, <clears throat> there's uh, about 59. They range from red heifers on down to calves, yeah. but they're, they're all ages. Well, you've got some money there. That's right. Now, we haven't even touched your land value. You have in excess of 700 acres of land. Uh, you have uh, many other things here, buildings, uh, lots of, uh, of things of worth. So. I'm guessing that perhaps you've got an investment here uh, approaching $200,000. Well, today's prices is probably right. Yeah. Well, Lawrence, one item of equipment that you have here we haven't mentioned, and it certainly is worth mentioning, and that's your liquid manure system. Now, it's my understanding that in your business, in the dairy business, the uh, getting rid of manure is one of the really big problems, and yet this liquid system seems to be a great one. Would you uh, describe it for me? Well, it's a, uh, it's a system of uh, underground tanks where the manure is scraped into uh, either every day or every other day. And uh, it's then, after a period of time, which we have capacity here for about two months, mm -hmm. it's pumped out and then put into a, a big tank on a spreader truck and then spread over the fields, mm -hmm. over, over pasture and alfalfa and so forth. What kind of an investment do you have in that piece of equipment? Well, the pump uh, cost around $1,300, and the, the truck was a used truck, and the tank run about another $2,000. Mm -hmm. But it certainly did help you with an otherwise uh, very big job, well, right? That's right. It saved this, uh, this everyday manure hauling yes. to this bad weather and mud and so forth. And with this system, uh, the manure is never touched. There's never a contact, is that's there? That's right. And, of course, this is important. That's right. Let me ask you a question that I asked John. I'd like to get your opinion on this. What do you think it's going to take, Lawrence, for the farmer today to go to the marketplace and instead of begging people to pay him whatever they want to for uh, his product, 
to go to the marketplace and state his price and get it, a fair price for his commodities. Well, that means all farmers pulling together and joining NFO and getting the job done. That's a very much to the point and brief answer, but most effective. Thank you very much, Lawrence. I've enjoyed visiting with yeah, you. You're welcome. And thank you, John, for having U.S. Farm Report out to your farm today. Glad to see you, and I uh, hope you come back sometime. Thank you very much. Okay. Victor Brimmer, with his wife and nine children, farms 329 acres, three miles southeast of Jefferson City, Missouri. Victor is a grade-A dairy farmer, milking 40 cows and raising his own feed on his rolling hills acreage. Victor's milk barn houses a pit-type milking parlor where he milks four cows at a time. Storage bins on the Brimmer farm store corn, barley, and wheat. Victor is especially proud of his automated feeding setup that makes bunk feeding a snap. This silo is 20 by 60 and has a capacity of 540 tons. Victor Brimmer is an NFO member of long standing, his membership dating from NFO's early dollar days. Ed, I enjoyed meeting Lawrence and John Wanzing and uh, Victor Brimmer. These people, I think, typify the progressive NFO dairy farmer. And I am sure that you were delighted to hear their enthusiasm over their membership and affiliation with NFO. I sure was, Bill. You know. Thank you very much for being my guest again. Glad to have been here. It's Bill. always a pleasure to see you, Ed. Thanks Thank you so very much. much. My special guest today has been Mr. Ed Groff, who heads the Dairy Commodity Department of NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. <laughs>